Yeah, so this is where we left off, you know, after we did so much in class today. Um, get myself a little pen here. So we're going to work out this first example. Uh, what's the molar heat of combustion? Whenever we combust 9.3 grams of liquid ethanol and we increase the temperature of our calorimeter by 3.54 um, Kelvin, and this is the heat capacity of our calorimeter. So I'm just going to set this up as, as a stoichiometry. I know that my molar heat of combustion needs to have the units of kilojoules per mole. So I'm just going to run with that. Starting with the numbers I was given. 9.03 grams. I know since one part of my molar heat of combustion has to be in moles, I'm going to need to get this guy in moles. So the molar mass of ethanol which, by the way, ethanol is C5, oh, C2, sorry, C2H5OH. Uh, molar mass of this guy is 46 point, like, 08, I think it is, grams per mole. And then the other number I have is this 3.54 Kelvin. And I'm going to use this number to convert it to joules. So I'm going to go ahead and throw that guy in there. And, um, since I know I'm going to want moles and kilojoules one over the other, I'm going to want my kilojoules to end up somewhere here on the bottom. So I'm going to go ahead and put my 75.8 kilojoules. The reason I want it to be on bottom is because I want my moles and my kilojoules to be opposite. And so one Kelvin is going to go here. And then the Kelvin that I was given, since I got a Kelvin on top, I can put a Kelvin on bottom. And I can go ahead and put it in this space here, or I can just extend this out and add another space, 3.54 Kelvin. Do whichever one you feel like. I know this looks like a hot mess, but you know, once you start manipulating units, it makes sense. So grams cancels out. My moles does not cancel out. My Kelvin cancels out. My kilojoules do not cancel out. And if you notice, you're gonna get your answers in moles per kilojoule. And it works out to 7.3 2 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per kilojoules. But my answer needs to be in kilojoules per mole. So all you have to do is invert this. So take this whole thing and put it over 1. And so you take 1 divided by that and you end up with like 1366 or since we're only allowed 3 sig figs, 1370 kilojoules per mole. And whenever you feel like it, you can pause this, you can rewind it if you need to hear me explain something again, or if as you're watching this you realize you have questions that I did not answer on here, then write them down and ask them in class tomorrow. Oh, wrong button. Okay, <clears throat> so that leads us to Hess's Law, which is also what your lab is about this week. Uh, basically, Hess's Law, if you carry out a reaction in a series of steps, you can take the delta H's for each individual step and add them up to get the delta H for the overall reaction. And the reason that this is nice is because determining the delta H for a reaction, for most reactions, like the whole reaction is really hard to do. Uh, and But breaking them down into each individual step, we have these lovely little things that I will show you at the back of your book, an appendix where we can look up the delta H uh, formation for all the different compounds and different elements and whatnot uh, that we can just add them all up and get the delta H of the re overall reaction. So the example that we're going to use is the production of sulfur trioxide. And so the overall reaction for sulfur trioxide looks like this. You have two sulfurs plus three oxygens react together to give us these two sulfur trioxides. This reaction is really hard to measure the delta H of. But these two individual steps, we know the delta H of. So the reaction occurs in these two steps. And to get the total delta H of the reaction, you just algebraically manipulate these guys and then put them together. And whatever you do to the equation, you also have to do to delta H. So that looks like this. Let's see. Oh, I want just like a plain screen. I guess I don't have that option. Oh, I can do this. Okay, so can you see my writing? Yes, you can. Yay! How do I get back to the other screen, I wonder? Uh, I guess we'll deal with that problem when we get there. So this was your overall reaction. Two sulfurs plus three oxygens gives us two 
sulfur trioxides. And we said that it happened in these two steps. First step, solid sulfur reacts with an oxygen molecule to produce the particularly stinky sulfur dioxide. And then two of those sulfur dioxides react with another oxygen molecule to produce our two sulfur trioxides. And the delta H's of these um, uh, reactions over here, this first one is negative 296.9 kilojoules. And this second one is negative 196.6 kilojoules. Remember, these numbers are negative not because it's a negative amount of energy, but because the energy is being released to the environment. These are very exothermic reactions. Now, to put these two reactions together so that we get this overall reaction, you can see we need two sulfurs. Well, in this particular reaction, we only have one sulfur. So if we take this whole reaction and multiply it by two, well, whatever we do to the reaction, we also have to do to the delta H. So we need to multiply this guy by 2. And so that gives us, you know, our new reaction is 2 sulfurs plus 2 oxygens gives us 2 sulfur dioxides for a delta H value of negative 593.8 kilojoules. And now if you notice, we have two SO2s on this side in this reaction and two S, basically, let's say we put all of these reactions together. So we have two SO2 plus an oxygen plus, going on to our next reaction, two sulfurs plus two more oxygens gives us two SO3s and two, uh, whoa, that's an S, SO2s. Well, you got two SO2s, you got two SO2s. Those guys will cancel out. Here you have an O2, here you have an O2. So you can combine these two and just say that you have three of them. And your overall reaction, if you notice, matches this guy now. So to figure out your delta H, you just take these two numbers and add them up. So negative 196.6 plus negative 593.8 gives you an overall delta H of negative 790.4 kilojoules for this reaction. Did I skip anything? No. All right, so what I was mentioning earlier, how we can know the delta H's for these little bitty simple reactions and not the big bad giant reactions is because of these lovely little enthalpies of formation, or delta H. Uh, and the enthalpies of formation, or delta HF, is a reaction, it, it only involves reactions that produce one mole of a substance from the elements that make it up in their most thermodynamic state. Basically what that means is like the Brinkelhoffs are always in twos, sulfur uh, I think is usually S8, um, you know, all the metals and the noble gases and things like that, they're elemental. So to form one mole of hydrogen iodide, the equation looks like this. It would, if we were balancing it pre-AP style, it would look like this. But this is a formation of one mole of a substance, so we take this entire equation and divide it by two, hence the one-halves. And the delta H of formation for this is a positive 25.94, which means that this is an endothermic reaction. Or that these elements would actually rather be hydrogen and iodine and not hydroiodic acid or hydrogen iodide, depending on what, you know, if it's dissolved in water or not. And so what do we use this for? Well, the heat that's absorbed when one mole of a substance is formed is your standard heat of formation up here. Um, and these, there's a ginormous table in the back of your book. It's actually four pages long. It starts on page A21 and goes all the way to A24. I recommend you pause this and turn to those pages in your book right now. And the standard heats of formation is what you use when you want to know the delta H of any reaction. And this is going to be a big part of your lab on Friday. And standard states means room temperature and one atmosphere of pressure.
that's what standard states mean. And most of the reactions that we do will be carried out at or really, really near standard states. So the thermochemical equation is basically back here we did this. This is a thermochemical equation. It's the individual elements added together to make our compound, but specifically to make only one mole of a compound. So that's what we're going to do with aluminum chloride. So the two elements that are part of aluminum chloride are, of course, aluminum and chlorine. But remember, chlorine is a Brinkelhoff, so he's going to be chlorine 2. And they're going to come together to form AlCl3. We need to balance this guy because obviously it's really not balanced. So we have two chlorines over here, three over here. So put a two there and a three there, and that balances our chlorines. And then we've got to stick a two out front here. But remember, we only want the thermochemical equation for the delta H not. This little zero means not. But basically for one mole of two AlCl3s. So divide this one by two, divide this one by two, and divide this one by two and you end up with your actual equation is an aluminum plus three halves of chlorine gives you one mole of aluminum chloride and you can actually find this equation in the back of your book on pages A uh, 21 to A24.